Hi, everyone. My name is Ellen Zong. I'm a scientific associate at DE Shaw Research. I also work as a software developer there. Um, and so today I'm going to be talking about the intersection of two fields, uh, drug discovery and computation. And in particular, I wanted to focus today's talk on visualization and some of the visualization techniques and how they can really aid us in understanding what's going on in our simulations and help aid in the computational drug discovery process. So DE Shaw Research is an independent research group founded in 2002 by David Shaw. We're about 100 people located in New York City. Our main high-level goal is to enable fundamental innovations in human biochemistry research, in drug discovery, and ultimately in human health. And so the main tool we use um, to enable this is, a, is called molecular dynamics, or MD simulation. And for this purpose, we also design and build supercomputers, which we've named Anton, um, to run these special purpose molecular simulations. And before I go into any detail on what MD simulation is, I want to show a visualization of the output of one of these simulations. And so we have, here we have a cancer drug, which is shown in orange. It originally starts out in free solution and eventually finds the binding pocket of this protein. And so this is a process that had never been seen before with that molecular dynamic simulation. But now we can easily visualize what is going on and what's happening as this cancer drug is binding to its target protein. And the other thing I want to mention is that while MD research is a highly specialized field, it's extremely interdisciplinary. It requires collaboration amongst biologists, chemists, computer scientists, engineers, mathematicians, physicists, fields that I think everyone here is at least uh, is pursuing or at least interested in. And so to motivate why we're interested in the drug discovery process, um, this graph is showing the number of new drugs brought to market per billions of dollars spent in research and development. And on the y-axis is a log scale. So you can see that the cost per producing each new drug has been increasing exponentially over the last 50 to 60 years. So much so that currently, all the way on the right side of the plot, we'd need to be spending over $1 billion on average to bring a new drug to market. And so there are a couple of hypotheses for why this is such an expensive process. One is that there's no more low-hanging fruit. A lot of traditional drug discovery uses high-throughput screening methods, which is essentially like guessing and checking. So it's not really that surprising that as we move forward through time, this becomes less and less effective. Um, a second reason is that 90% of drug candidates fail in clinical trials. So this kind of indicates that the drugs coming out of the initial drug discovery pipeline aren't as high quality or aren't as effective as we think they are or could be more effective. And finally, dozens of major diseases with well-understood biology still remain undruggable today. So even though we've made a lot of progress in understanding how a lot of these diseases work, we know specifically which systems we have to hit, we know what they look like at the molecular level, yet we still haven't been able to find a compound, a drug, to um, target these diseases. So all of this together kind of suggests that we might, be, we might want to approach the drug discovery process from a new angle, which is computation, what I'll be talking about today. Um, when I talk about the, these pharmaceutical compounds, I'm talking about small molecules which uh, bind to proteins. And so you can think of proteins as the molecular machines of our body. Um, they're responsible for a diverse array of functions in our body, including catalyzing chemical reactions, replicating DNA, signaling, um, responding to external stimuli, as well as many other things. And one thing to know about proteins is that they're all formed from the same 20 amino acids, uh, which are linked together and then self-interact to fold into a specific three-dimensional structure. And it's the three-dimensional structure of the protein that determines this function, and we can easily see this through visualization. So on the left here, we have this potassium channel protein. These are in the membranes of your cell. They have the center pore through which they allow potassium ions to selectively diffuse through. And so this is a very important protein in your neural responses. In the center, we have an antibody antigen complex. So these have hypervariable loops you can kind of see between the two. Uh, they mutate very, very readily in order to bind and detect foreign objects in your body. So these are very important for your immune response. And then on the right side, we have a transcription factor protein that's binding to DNA. And so these are responsible for gene, gene transcription. And so again, another very important piece of how our bodies work. 
And then so small molecules are smaller compounds which bind to these proteins and change the activity of those proteins, either increase their efficacy at doing whatever they're supposed to be doing or turn them off. And your body has a lot of endogenous small molecules that are created to help regulate your protein's acti activity. Um, however, when one of these processes goes wrong, this often manifests itself in diseases. And so the way that a lot of small molecule drug compounds work is by binding to these proteins uh, a specific protein in order to artificially modulate the protein's activity, which hopefully has the desired downstream effect of treating or curing your disease. And so molecular dynamic simulation is a computational tool that we can use to provide uh, a lot of insight into the thermodynamic and kinetic properties of these protein drug molecule systems. Um, it's an iterative scheme, and so the first step is computing the forces acting on each atom from all other atoms, and then integrating Newton's equations of motion and updating the positions and velocities of these atoms appropriately. And this is an iterative process because we need to repeat this over and over and over again through time. And the output of, these, of an MD simulation is a time series of the atomic positions of, where, of, the, of the positions of where these atoms have gone. And we can analyze this trajectory to help understand what's going on in bridge theory and experiment. And so what do we get from an output? What we get from the output of an MD simulation can be thought of as a computational microscope. Um, with sufficiently long and accurate simulations, we could watch these biomolecular mechanisms happen, watch proteins fold and unfold, which is this uh, video on the right, and we can watch proteins interact with other drug molecules. And so often this is extremely useful to understand systems that may be hard or expensive to assess experimentally. For example, um, some process may happen at time scales or spatial scales that are um, indetectable through experiment. Or for example, you want to study a drug molecule that doesn't yet exist. And so on the right, in the orange, we have the experimental structure of this protein. So we've run the simulation and we can verify, we can see the actual folding process happen for this protein. And I want to briefly go over what's so hard about this problem. What makes this problem really interesting? Um, they, these, fall under, these problems fall under two general categories. The first is sampling. And so these systems that we're looking at are tens of thousands of atoms up to millions of atoms. And so um, computing the forces on all these atoms is extremely computationally expensive, especially we, if we want to iterate up to time scales where we can actually see interesting chemistry happen. And then the second class of interesting problems is force field, or the underlying model. Um, which we use to compute the forces acting on each, of, on each of our atoms. If this is not sufficiently accurate, then no matter how long we simulate, even in the limit of infinite sampling, we may not be observing or we wouldn't really get um, any useful information out of our simulations. And so I could digress. With this computational tool, um, if we're interested in a drug discovery project, what should we be looking for? So what should we do? And while the entire drug development pipeline is uh, very long, very challenging, it's important to remember the road to developing a new drug always begins with discovering a good binding pocket on some target protein and a good small molecule binder to that binding pocket. And so an interdisciplinary drug discovery program can use MD simulation to identify novel binding pockets that wouldn't be detectable through experiment and then small molecule binders to those binding pockets. And so here are some examples. Um, long timescale simulations can identify pockets. We use a lot of automated algorithms to find uh, pockets in our trajectory frames, um, but often these pockets, uh, these algorithms are not that consistent, so visualization also plays a very important role in understanding um, what the chemical nature of these pockets are like. And so these binding pockets are typically some concave region in the pocket, and so are a concave region in the protein. And so visualizing the protein using a surface accessible, um, solvent accessible surface area representation is usually the most intuitive for these uh, simulations. But not only are we interested in the geometry of these pockets, we're also interested in the chemical properties. And furthermore, we're not, in, we're not only interested in a lot of different chemical properties, we're also interested in, in how these chemical properties change through time. And so here we're able to combine all of these in one visualization by only viewing the sticky atoms in the simulation. And so essentially we're only uh, displaying atoms which have not moved some 
amount of distance over some sliding window of time. And on the left, we've done this with water molecules. We can see the intricate hydrogen bonding networks in this protein. And on the right, we've done the same thing. We've run a sim but we've thrown a bunch of chemical fragment uh, probe molecules into the simulation. And so we can really easily and quickly see what the chemical features are of this pocket of the protein, um, where the sticky parts of the protein are. And so once a binding pocket is identified, the next step in the drug discovery process is to identify potential small molecules or ligands which can bind to this pocket. And so what makes a good binder? A good binder is a molecule that will stick to the target pocket uh, very strongly, and this depends on the particular geometry and chemistry of the pocket. There are a lot of ex uh, experimental techniques that can assay this binding strength, and we also have computational techniques uh, to um, estimate the binding strength again. But what visualization gives us is it allows us to really understand what's responsible for the binding affinity. Uh, in other words, it allows us to understand whatever interactions are going on between the ligand and the protein. Uh, for example, important interactions include um, electrostatic interactions or hydrogen bonding uh, networks. Another, other important interactions are hydrophobic interactions, and we can render these, we can render areas of relative hydrophobicity or positive and negative charge in the po binding pocket, which is the figure on the top. And we can use this to um, further understand what's going on and to design better compounds for the pocket. And visualization is obviously indispensable, which leads me to my next slide, which is the full movie of the process that I just described. Um, the first step is a long MD simulation. And what I like about this is it really shows the dynamics of the protein. You wouldn't really be able to see like how the protein is moving and how flexible it is through experimental techniques. And then perhaps one of our pocket detection algorithms finds some binding pocket in the protein. Um, we can visualize it to assess how druggable this is, whether it is amenable to targeting. We can see the areas of hydrophobicity or a positive, positive or negative charge. And then eventually we can design compounds that will fit into this pocket. And I think what visualization allows us, it allows us to really understand the chemical reasons and the structural reasons and this can help us further our long-term rational drug design goals, but it can also help us with shorter goals like uh, improving our physical models. And so what we've done here is we've chosen one of the compounds. Once we've designed the compounds, then we can run further simulations of the compound in the binding pocket of the protein to, uh, test, to test how um, strongly it binds the protein, whether it actually does the things that we think it will do. And so in the next part of my talk, I wanted to start uh, answering the question, what do proteins look like? So you've already gotten a few videos of what this is. But an important thing to keep in mind is from simulation, um, the output is just a series of floating point numbers representing the X, Y, Z Cartesian coordinates of the atoms in the system. And it's a very, very, very large amount of floating point numbers. And so the role of visualization is to understand, to interpret these floating point numbers into something that we can easily uh, understand. And so we have very, um, a lot of different options for how we represent the system. Experimentally, through techniques like X-ray crystallography, we can view the electron densities of the atoms and the protein. And so that's something that we'd see on the uh, figure all the way to the left. From simulation, we can visualize the bonds of the system. And so that would be the representation in the center. But if we're interested in larger protein structural properties, then perhaps this is too much detail. So we want to abstract some more detail away and maybe view um, bonds between alpha carbons or a cartoon representation of secondary structural elements. So we have lots of different options in how we actually represent what this protein looks like. In addition to representation, shape and color are just as important. Here we have the exact same protein. But on the left, we visualized it through a cartoon representation where the different colors represent different secondary structural elements. In green, we have beta sheets. In orange, we have alpha helices of these proteins so we can understand how this protein fits together and how it's folded. On the right, we have a volume representation of the protein um, colored by the atomic elements of uh, the atoms and the protein. So we can quickly see what shape this protein is and what pockets it might have. 
And so the overall point I'm trying to make is that the visual design of these figures and animations is just as important as the efficiency of the underlying implementation of our simulation when we're trying to understand these chemical systems. Um, so here, we don't really see that much, but we can employ less physical effects to reduce visual noise and heightened clarity. We can use different representations to convey, uh, depending on what we're trying to convey. For example, van der Waals radii, a ribbon representation, a salt, uh, surface representation. And even though we're trying to represent a three-dimensional system, we can draw from techniques from traditional schematic diagrams, such as flat shading or adding strong outlines. We can also add shadows, occlusion, and fogs or fog approximations to help, help assist with depth perception. And so ultimately, while we have many knobs to turn for these different representations, we're interested in maximizing the readability and understanding our final visualization. And so there are lots of options. And this is like definitely a very fun part of um, looking at these systems. And finally, I wanted to end on some of the challenges for visualization software in the field of molecular dynamics. Um, it must allow for a real-time visualization of the time series data, and this is definitely a very hard infrastructure challenge. Um, it must allow for diverse representation styles, depending on what we're trying to communicate, and uh, further integration of these visualization techniques with quantitative analyses is definitely something that we're actively working on. And together, visualization is a overall an indispensable tool in analyzing these MD simulations. Um, and can yield crucial insights into these biochemical systems that would be otherwise difficult to quantify or understand. And so that's all I have. Uh, thanks for listening. All the visualizations you've seen today are, were made from an in-house so, uh, graphics software package that we are developing. Um, and I'll be at the Opportunities Fair with other members of DHR Research um, to answer any questions you might have about this material or about anything else that DHR Research is working on. Thanks.